This podcast includes information provided by the issuer and does not express the views of the interviewer. This podcast may also include forward-looking statements by the issuer that involve certain risks and uncertainties to its business. Because forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, the issuer's actual results could differ from those indicated in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. And you are listening to episode 29. By the way, if you like what you hear, I would greatly appreciate if you rate and review the podcast on iTunes so that more investors can learn about the world of microcap stocks and join in on the conversation. For this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Christian Reither, Portfolio Manager at Kareen Capital. The topic for today is when to buy and sell microcap stocks. You've heard a lot of different investing strategies and what to look for in microcap stocks, but what's been lightly discussed thus far is what to do next. When should I buy? How much should I buy? When do I sell? The reason I wanted to speak with Christian on this topic is to continue this conversation that he also discusses in his educational YouTube video series, uh, which is available on his website, kareencapital.com. The goal for this interview is to learn more about when to buy and sell microcap stocks and the reasons for both. Thank you again for tuning in to episode 29 of the Planet Microcap podcast. Please enjoy my interview with Christian Reither, but first, a word from our sponsor. A comprehensive streaming of market data, research, and portfolio management application for you. QuoteStream is a real-time streaming quotes and research system designed for the day trader, retail investor, institutional investor, both new and old. QuoteStream offers low-latency, tick-by-tick data, advanced charting, comprehensive technical analysis, news, and research. With no software to install and no servers to maintain, QuoteStream is the ideal solution for you. Go to stocknewsnow.com and start your free 7-day trial. Click the quote stream banner in the header or real-time quotes in the nav bar to get started building and managing your investments. For this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I have Christian Reither on the program. He's the portfolio manager at Kareen Capital. Christian, welcome to the Planet Microcap podcast. Thanks, Robert. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. It's great to have you on our program and... uh, you know, to, to start off this conversation, I'll get into why we uh, I wanted to speak with you today in a bit. But first, uh, let, let's get your background and how did you get into investing in microcap stocks? Okay. Um, well, back in high school, I got interested in investing. I read some uh, Peter Lynch book. It was either One Up on Wall Street or Beating the Street. And I thought that uh, this investing stuff sounds pretty cool. Um, you could get paid for being smart, which... which was appealing to me then. Um, I started investing then with my own money, and I've, I've seen like old broker statements, and it's it's like uh, kind of depressing. I owned like Ford and Microsoft and maybe Paychex, and like just nothing, nothing intelligent or special. Um, but at least it got me started. Um, I probably didn't really know what I was doing until a couple of years after business school. So I got my CFA. I got my MBA, I worked for a couple hedge funds, and only in that last little bit did I actually start to figure out what I was doing. Um, and after working for hedge funds for a couple of years, I started Kareem Capital in June 2013. And in terms of micro caps, I think I bought my first micro cap maybe 2012, before the fund. Um, and I, I, I think of them as just sort of part of the investing universe. I, I don't treat them that differently than than any other size class. Hmm. Well, why is that? Do you do you basically? Well, this actually leads into my next question. But is that because of your investing strategy that you've developed, you know, since high school? Yeah, um, the investing strategy that I follow which is the one that works for me, you know, we got three key criteria. So I want to have a good business, I want to have a good management team, and I want to have a good price. So for me, a good business earns returns on tangible capital above 20%. So they make money, I know how they make money, and I can see how they're going to keep making money in a a difficult competitive world. Um, They've got a good management team, so the 
management team can operate that business in the way that's best for the business, and they're also going to allocate the capital that comes out of that good business so that the money actually makes it to me. And like, I get either paid or you're making this thing more valuable over time, so I get paid in a higher stock price. Um, and by a cheap stock, I want to have a five to one upside to downside ratio or better. So when I look at what could go wrong at this company, I'm not going to get obliterated unless I can make like bazillions of dollars just getting to the sort of fair value. Um, so th those, those are my three sort of key criteria. So it doesn't matter if I'm looking at, you know, um, an S&P 500 company or a micro cap, I always want to have that good business, a good management that I can trust and a stock price that I find compelling and, and tilts the odds into my favor. So that, that's, yeah, that, that's why I treat microcaps the same way as any anything else, because I'm always sort of looking for that same magical combination. And bazillion is a technical term, right? Yeah, it's a technical term. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, all right. For, for today's episode, what I wanted to talk with you, and it's something that we've kind of touched on a little bit here at the podcast, but I really wanted to have a nice conversation to understand it fully. And that's, well, it's two topics, actually. One is the actual buying and selling of stock. Um, and so first off, you find a company, you'd like to invest in it. It's checked all the boxes on your list, like what you just said. Uh, you've met with management. They meet your criteria. You know, now it's time to buy stock. You know, how, how do you size into your initial position? And maybe you can explain what I mean by that question, actually. Okay. Yeah. The, I've got one basic answer, but it's different from microcaps, and I'll get into that a little later. But um, the, the basic for me is if it ticks all my boxes, so good business, good management, good price, um, and I... I'll write about it in my investment journal, and if I, I still want to buy it after that exercise, then I'll go in and I want, you know, a 10% position for this thing. Like, that, that'll that come out of what I write in the investment journal. But, like, a basic start point for me is 10 maybe even 15% um, of the portfolio goes into this new thing. And I will go in, if I can, and buy all of that in one day. So if the price is attractive to me and the volume is there, I will go in and buy it at 10%. If, if I find something that's really good where I love the business, I really, really like the management team, and the price is just like way better than a 5 to 1 upside downside, then I might make it a 20% position. But it has to be like superior on, on, all those, on all those levels. And every once in a while, maybe, you know, once in a decade, if I'm like lucky or something like that, I might find some like awesome, awesome opportunity where I'm just blown away by everything. Um, then I'll make it even bigger than 20. You know, I could go to 30 or 40. Even. Like it'd be amazing to find something that'd be worth half of the portfolio someday. But it would have to be super amazing on all of those levels where I feel like I've got downside protection if I'm wrong. Yeah, just super cheap price going to, to something big. So the just oh, oh, is, real quick, Christian, Christian yeah. hold on real quick. Um, but I want to just clarify one thing real quick. You know, you're our portfolio manager. So when you mean, uh, you know, you're 10% of the portfolio, that's what you're talking about, right? Not like you're going in to buy 10% of the company. It, just just to be clear. No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. okay. You're, you're absolutely right. It's 10% of the portfolio that I'm putting in. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so now what's the difference then when it comes to investing in microcaps? Um, so I've got one microcap that now I've been trying to buy for like six weeks, and today I managed to, you know, get $900 worth of it. And so it's like, <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, I would love to buy the full position in one day, but it just won't let me. <laughs> so that, that that puts a wrench in that, that plan. Mm. Um but yeah, if, if I see a price that I like, I will take that price because I don't know what's coming tomorrow. So that, that's, that's my idea. It's like I don't wait for things to get better because I have no basis on which to expect them to get better in terms of the, the market price. So basically with microcaps, there's this issue of uh, availability of shares to actually be bought. Is that some, That's what you're basically saying, right? 
Yeah, that's that's what I've been running into lately. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you really, you, so what you would say then is like, look, if you, it, it's we're talking about microcaps. So it, in a microcap company, if it's available, if the if the amount of shares that you're looking to buy are available, you better go in and get it. If you, I mean, if it checks off all the boxes, of course. I think yeah, that's the only that's the only decision you can make that's sort of rational because. If you want to wait for something better, I think you're just hoping and dreaming. Mm. Um, all you have is the price that's in front of you, the you know the shares that are offered at a certain price. You can either take that and and be certain of getting it, or or you're living in some sort of magical world where things will get better tomorrow. Or and I I just don't live in that world. All I all I have is what's in front of me. Mm. Well, let's let's take the let's play devil's advocate. Let's say the person who you know, wants to take a small position to start, you know, just to, it's checked all the boxes and, you know, at same, same type of criteria to start the same premise, but they would rather go in and buy, you know, let's say they were happy with buying $900 worth of stock, you know, just to start, you know, and, and then maybe scale up or perhaps there's a massive market sell off and the, you know, for some weird reason, the stock goes down for, you know, none of the reasons that you normally would, uh, expect it to go down, you know, maybe it's just the market at large just having a, a weird day, you know, and then they think, oh, okay, well, maybe now's a good time to go in and buy because I bought it at this price. I loved it at that price. Well, now I can go in and buy it at this price, you know, so what would you say to someone who has that strategy? I think, I mean, what I'm describing is what works for me. Um, and I think you got to try lots of different stuff to see what, what works for you, what sort of feels good and makes makes logical sense so the right answer for me uh, at this stage in my life is I go in and I take what I can uh, when I want it that's not going to be the right answer for everybody mm -hmm. um, and I think that you get to that as you sort of try stuff and you're like you go in and you take a small stake and then the stock price shoots up and you hate yourself <laughs> or you're like me and you go in and you take a big stake and then you know it's 09 and <laughs> you're like, well, that was terrible. So like your experience uh, will inform your future actions, but mine, mine are go in when I can get it. Cause I, I can't predict when the market's going to collapse. Um, I've been terrified of it forever and doesn't care what I think. So for sure. And, and, um, okay. So, you know, I'm going to come back to you because I had another question that I wanted to ask about that. But um, what I want to move on to is then, you know, for those who, who don't know, you know, can, can you explain the difference then between, you know, cost averaging up versus cost averaging down and when this typically happens? Sure, sure. Um, cost averaging up is when you are buying at a higher price. Um, than the average of what you've paid before. So now your average price paid for that, that position moves up. So it, it usually happens when the stock price has moved up. I mean, it basically has to happen when the stock price has moved up. Whereas dollar co cost averaging down um, is when you add to your position at a lower price. So now you're lowering the, the average price that you've paid. And so it's usually you average up when the stock price is going up, you average down when the stock price is going down. And I'm in the camp that says that the the market or the the stock doesn't care, doesn't know that you own it, so none of this stuff should matter. But it does matter, and I've actually got you know a line to myself written on the whiteboard in my office um, about this because it somehow does matter. And I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so basically when someone says, okay, I'm cost averaging up, you know, usually that happens, I guess, when, um, obviously you're, you're invested in a company and uh, stock price starts to go up and you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, you know, I still think it might be undervalued even at this price, you know, so I might go in and buy some more shares, thus making the, the average cost of the purchase price of the shares to go up, you know, so is that usually a typical time when, when people like, have you done that? So the way I'm doing it is because I'm coming in or trying to come in on day one with my full position size, if the stock price moves up 
and I want to still come in at that new higher price and, and average up, it means that there's new information out there. So for me, when I average up, maybe I've gotten new money, but aside from that, if I'm averaging up, it's because new information has come out, either the, the quarter or the annual report has come out with better than expected operational information, and so the, the business is worth more, so now that five to one upside downside price has moved up, and so I, I still want to buy more. Mm -hmm. Or there is some sort of new information where something good has happened at that company. Um, and usually you have something good, demonstrably good information comes out. The stock price pops. But when I look at it, I'm like, this company is worth way more than it used to be, or my downside case has been eliminated because something, you know, now bankruptcy is no longer an option or they, they kept that big contract or whatever it is. So now I'm like, okay, I like this business more or I like this management more. So even at this higher price, this is still or even better, this is a more attractive opportunity than it used to be. So maybe my five to one upside downside price was 20, mm -hmm. and now it's like 30, but the stock price has moved up to 25, and I'm like, okay, I, I should have this be a bigger position because of this new information, because of my new improved understanding of the business. Mm -hmm. um, that's when I average up. And then, and then conversely, you know, when, when do you average down? I mean, we've heard all the phrases, you know, the, the try to try to try not to catch the falling knife and, and all that stuff. But, you know, if you really know the business inside and out and you're, you're basing your positioning on your own calculation and valuation that you put into it, you know, when then would be a time that you would cost average down? Um, or like when you gotta, when, when gotta, you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no. I, I got a, I got this. Um, I got a caveat on it. But um, so if so, when I when I cost average when I average down, it's usually that there's no new information. There's just a new lower price. Mm -hmm. um, so this happened in you know January February this year, where I averaged down on Keysight, which is stock that I still own. Um, and like the, the stock price dropped, I don't know, from 30 to 21 or 22 or something like that. And there was nothing, literally nothing new that I could find about the company. It was just the stock price had changed. So at that point, my upside downside ratio had just gone crazy. And so I'm like, well, at this price, I've got a super attractive upside downside ratio. I want to own more of this. I want a bigger position. So that's like the simple, rational part of it. What I have on my whiteboard says, if you want to average down, wait with, you know, exclamation points after that. Because what I've learned over time is like, when I want to average down, when all my rational basis says this should be a bigger position because you had the same information and a better price, I found that the market isn't quite ready. Uh, <laughs> so like... Every time that I've done this, and I've gone back to my investment journals to check it, like every time that I've averaged down, I would have been at least as well off if I had waited. So, so for me, I think I average up when I've got new information and I understand it better than other people because this is like a company I care about. So if new information comes out that's positive, I act because the market hasn't figured it out yet. Whereas on the downside, when the market is overreacting for who knows what reason, I am I know more than the market and I should wait for them because they're just going to keep pushing it down for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, that's, that's my thought on like the rational numbers part of it on averaging down. Like you want there to be no bad information. Mm -hmm. um, you just want a better price. But in my experience, I... I figured that out before anybody else, and they just keep pushing the price down past where I buy. Nice. Okay, so now to the second topic of this of this uh, interview, and that's when to sell. And there, I know there. there what, what, okay, let me ask this in the form of a question, <laughs> rather than just making a blanket statement. Um, <laughs> what what are what are the various reasons why you would start selling off your position and is it always for negative reasons? It's not always for negative reasons. Um, 
I'll start with the negative reasons. Like the negative reason could be like you get new information, like the company does something, the management does something, or a competitor does something, and you're like, wow, that that just torpedoed my thesis. Like I thought this was a great manager and they just did something stupid, or I thought this was a good industry that you know nobody could enter and you just had somebody enter the business and like disrupt the apple cart. So that's like bad news that kills your thesis and then I think you just got to sell it because it's like if you hold on like you're holding on for some like hopes and dreams whereas what you what you came in for is no longer true so that's that's bad um you can also have like good reasons to sell um which are the much better ones like that's when the stock price has gone up and now my upside downside ratio is no longer very attractive. So I start selling when my upside to downside ratio gets to one. So mm-hmm. it's still cheap on a, a reasonable basis, but like I'm, I'm more and more exposed if bad things happen, if, if I didn't quite understand this thing correctly. Um, and then I'll keep selling as it goes up and, and, and wipe out the position. And that's nice because, you know, I made my gains and I'm selling at a, a price that I no longer really want to own this thing. Mm. The other sort of positive reason to sell is if you find something else that's really, really great and you just want to own it, but you got no cash. And so you got to sell something. And then, then you look at your portfolio and you say, okay, what in this would I be willing to sell to own this new shiny investment? And then, then you're upgrading the portfolio because you're buying something that you like more. Mm-hmm. Um, and you really evaluate that because, like, this new shiny thing better be awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's another reason to sell. It's like mm-hmm. you got something even better or you made a mistake <laughs> or, um, or well, the world told you you were wrong mm-hmm. or you just made all, all the money you're going to make on this for a while and it's safer to be out of the stock. So those, those are my reasons, and they're not all bad. Mm-hmm. This might be a silly question when it comes to selling, but have you ever like sold a little bit at a time at, for whatever reason? Um, I've done a lot of stuff. Uh, <laughs> so I've got, I've, I've done one thing where I've like, uh, I, I've checked this in my journal. It's like there have been a couple times that I sold because I was worried about the market. Mm-hmm. And when I went back and checked, that was 100% terrible. <laughs> like every time I did that, it was a terrible mistake. So I, I can't judge the market, so I don't. I don't sell for that. But I have sold stuff for vague reasons about the market, and that's never been good. So I don't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I sell off like portions of a position. Uh, so let's say, okay. So let's say I find a great business, and it's awesome. So I make it like twenty-five percent of the portfolio because it's like super awesome, and the upside downside ratio is like twenty-five to one or something crazy. When, if that stock goes up, the stock price goes up and it gets to a five to one stock price, I look at that and I'm like, well, this doesn't deserve to be a huge part of the portfolio anymore because now it's even bigger because it's gone up. And, and at that point, like at a five to one upside downside, it should be like a normal position for me, like, you know, 10, 12%. Mm. So then I sell it down to 10, 12% because it's no longer that magical great opportunity now it's just like a good opportunity mm-hmm. and so it deserves a good opportunity size mm-hmm. and that's hard to do because that's mm-hmm. not you just you've seen it go up you expect it to keep going up but it shouldn't be like what works for me is to take that back down to the normal side mm-hmm. so i still love the thing but i don't i don't want to marry it like <laughs> the same way right. um and then once it gets to a, a one-to-one upside downside i start selling it off in drips and drabs, and then if it gets like, I don't know, 0. 0.6 or 0. 0.5, I, I just sell the whole thing because that's like thin ice for me. Mm-hmm. All right, I have another somewhat, uh, well, maybe it's not a silly question. I don't know. There's no silly questions, right? Anyways. There are no silly questions, no. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I know there's, there's many reasons for when to buy and when to sell. We've gone over quite a bit now, but I'm, I'm interested when it comes to like – like cyclicals, you know, different industries that are more cyclical, you know, I mean, I I don't know, I don't know if you necessarily, you know, invest in some of those or not, but, um, 
even if whether you do or not, you know, I, I'd love to know your opinion about when to get in and out based on the, you know, the cyclical nature of whatever sector it may be, like mining, for instance. Um, so I'm in a oil related stock and I've lost money on that. So that hurts. And I'm in a housing related stock. Um, uh, Keysight, which I mentioned before, is an electrical engineer tool making related stock, and that's got cycles too. Um, so I am in some cyclical businesses. What I try to do with everything is I value it twice, right? So to get my upside downside ratio, I have my reasonable scenario of what happens over the next three to five years. Mm -hmm. And then I have my downside scenario of what happens over the next three or five years. Mm -hmm. And so with any cyclical business, that downside scenario has to incorporate a down cycle. Um, like you have to like, Oil now, like, is in a down cycle or, or has been through one, and so you know what they look like. Um, but you should put that in. So it's like maybe you think it's reasonable that this is the bottom of the cycle, and so it's going to improve over the next three years, next five years, whatever. So that's your reasonable case. But then you got to put in, because you know this is a cyclical industry of, like, okay, the downside scenario is, like, this is not the troughs. This is, like, you know the third floor and we've still got a few floors before we hit their bottom. Mm -hmm. um, and what does that look like? What does that make this business worth? And so that's going to really mess up your upside downside value and where, where you're willing to buy it at a five to one price. So I think with cyclical businesses, they're great to invest in. They can explode. I mean, they are going to have booms just like they have busts. Um, and you can get in and have, uh, you know, a 10 bagger or something crazy with them in a few years. But the way to do that intelligently is to incorporate that downside value and incorporate the, the bust into that and have things get worse and only buy when you're not getting obliterated if that happens. Like mm -hmm. the company doesn't go bankrupt if that happens and, you know, the bondholders get to own the stock instead of you. Mm -hmm. For sure. All right, so... You know, we've gone through a bit of your experience already, but can you recall like that one experience in your investing career that helped shape your investing strategy like that? The one that stands out. Uh, I'd say the one that stands out for me is post holdings. Um, that's I mean, it's a popular stock now and it's not cheap and I haven't owned it in a couple of years. But I bought it after the spin off in early two thousand and twelve. It was like January, February two thousand and twelve. And I bought it. And it was like a I don't know, billion dollar company or something like that. But maybe a billion dollars of debt on top of that. Uh, so not tiny. Um, and outsiders hadn't come out yet, so nobody knew that Bill Sturitz who runs Post was is like a super capital allocator, like he had been around with Ralston Purina, and if you paid attention, you could have seen that he was awesome, but I totally missed it, and so did everybody else. So what was good about that and sort of my, 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 my strategy is good business, good price, good management, and I like weird stuff like special situations or, you know, micro caps. Um, and that came out of post because it was this great business. I think I bought it at 10 times earnings. Um, I mean, cereals are, are facing some secular decline right now because people eat different stuff, but it's still been holding up pretty well. Um, so I had a great price. I had this great business with, you know, high returns on capital. Um, and I thought that the, the manager was probably okay. Um, and what happened was in September of that year, just like on one day, the company went out and bought back 5% of its stock at what I thought was still a great price, like 10, 11 times earnings. And I was like, what? Like, this is, this is really great. <laughs> like, this is good news. Um, and that caused me to reevaluate my impression of the management. I was like, wow, these guys are not just mediocre managers who are doing okay. They, they, they did something weird with this 5% buyback in one day, um, like from a, Ralcorp, the former owner. Um, and I was like, this is a better management team 
in terms of capital allocation than I knew before. So that that led me to like good businesses with good managers who are also good capital allocators at a good price. Um, the stock hadn't done anything until then, and then it started to move up. Um, I put in a little bit more money in my IRA because this was before the fund, but I didn't I didn't back up the truck the way I should have when I had this new positive information. Um, and what I liked about it was then I went to the annual meeting, which was in February, so February 2013, and there were only two other investors there. And this was after Outsiders had come out, so Steerage was starting to become known. Um, it's a billion-dollar company. And I got to talk to him because he was a friendly guy, and he at this point wasn't even doing earnings calls, so this was the only way to get to talk to him. Um, and he said, yeah, we'll do buybacks when it's a good price, and when it's a high price, we'll sell stock. And that was useful for me to sell the stock later when they did some converts that was essentially selling stock. So he was like a good capital allocator who was telling everybody that he thought it was time to sell stock. And I got to learn that because I showed up at this thing. So it's that all that fits in with like go to things. It doesn't even have to be small, but you go to things where other people aren't like at this annual meeting where, you know, there's three of us um, regardless of size. Pay attention to good businesses, and good managers are really worth a lot when they make when they make smart capital allocation decisions. Um, so that that I made enough money on it, and it was you know psychically rewarding enough that I've, I've kept it that sort of <laughs> trying to trying to dig through that vein um, and, and get that ore. Mm -hmm. So what what advice then do you have for new microcap investors? Um. My advice to investors, new investors of any kind, is you know put in your own money because it hurts a whole lot more than just sort of thinking about it and reading about it. Um, you'll you'll learn so much more from the market than from from anybody else. Um, so you got to put in your own money, not necessarily all of it, but like, like you know two thousand dollars hurts. Like you don't have to put in two hundred thousand dollars to start. Um, and keep an investment journal so that you mm -hmm. write down why you're doing before you do it because it's been it's been so helpful for me to be able to look back and say you know when when have i averaged down when have i sold you know stocks just because i'm worried about i don't know the shiller pe or the federal reserve or whatever the heck it is and what was the outcome of that and that's really really hard to do if you don't if you haven't written it down somewhere so some people blog but i say use an investment journal and then you can go back and like reconstruct the history of like, okay, I did that. What, what were things looking like six months later? It's like, was that smart or was that dumb? Because um, your memory will, will totally fade. Like I've, I've noticed myself misremembering lots of stuff that I, I was sure of. And then I go back and I read and I'm like, oh, I was totally lying to myself. Mm -hmm. So those are my pieces of advice for new investors anywhere. In terms of micro caps, I'd say buyer beware. Like this is uh, wild west. Like you can get amazing deals. You can like go out to this virgin prairie and like take a you know ten square miles of prime land, but you can also get shot in the back by somebody, and there's nobody who's going to come and save you. Like uh, uh, I think it's uh, I, I'd be I'd be scared. Like. Obviously, I'm buying a microcap now, and I've got another one that I've, is no longer a microcap in the portfolio. So I know that this is where some amazing things are that can still have huge runways for growth, but it's also where there's like toxic waste. So come in and be skeptical. <laughs> that would be my particular advice to microcaps. So, yeah. Stay skeptical. That's, that's the tagline for this interview. So where, where can our audience go and find more information about you and Kareen Capital? I'd say come to the website, uh, kareencapital.com. Um, I'm on Twitter and YouTube, but there are links to both of those on the website. Um, yeah, that, that's sort of like the, the front door. Right? Go there, yeah. Nice. Go through the front door, everybody. Christian, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so much for coming on the podcast i really do appreciate uh you coming on and sharing your insights uh, this is a lot of fun thank you very much i think you do good work and i'm, I'm happy to contribute what i can thank you so much and uh, i'll be in touch okay thanks so much thanks robert 
Thank you all for tuning in to the Planet Microcap podcast. And thank you, Christian, again for coming on to the program. You can access the podcast by going on to stocknewsnow.com under podcast. Go to podbean.com and search Planet Microcap podcast or on iTunes and search Planet Microcap podcast. Stay tuned for the next Planet Microcap podcast where we'll have our next guest to discuss all things microcap. If you have any questions or comments about the podcast, please send an email to info at stocknewsnow.com. I'd love to hear from all of you. This podcast has been brought to you by SNN Incorporated, publishers of stocknewsnow.com, the official microcap news source, and the microcap review magazine. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you again for joining me on the Planet Microcap podcast. Have a great week, everyone.